This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 949, recorded on October 27, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And joining us today from Hawaii, Vincent. Yes, I'm <laughs> at the big island today where it is uh, 11 a.m. And for you, Daniel, it's just the end of the day, right? <laughs> I-, I wish it was the end of the day. It's only 5 p.m. <laughs> lots okay. More, lots more day to go. <laughs> All well, right. Let's, well, let's jump get- in. <laughs> <laughs> we will. All right. I'll start with my quotation. Uh, Never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth and compassion against injustice and lying and greed. If people all over the world would do this, it would change the earth. Um, And that was William Faulkner. And this is from the speech he gave when asked by his daughter Jill to speak um, at her high school graduation, University High School in Oxford, Mississippi, 1951. And I'm a huge Faulkner fan and actually uh, sort of was uh, reminded of my interest in Faulkner by a recent book I read, uh, Breathless, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. David Quammen is also a big Faulkner fan. Um, Yeah. You know, Faulkner, though, had a... Faulkner had a bad influence on me. Why is that, Daniel? Well, you know, I had read um, The Unvanquished right before uh, high school graduation. So I decided, you know, much like the character, I could cut my hair with a pocket knife. Who needed a fancy barber? So, uh, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) No, I love I love Faulkner. I love I love the way his sentences just go on and just just how much it's about the language. Um, But all right, let's get right into it. Uh, polio, an interesting week for polio. I think I can say that. Um, as our listeners may or may not have heard, uh, ja- Dr. Janelle Ruth, the CDC's team leader for domestic polio, announced that they are in discussions with New York State and New York City colleagues about the use of the novel oral polio virus to stop the current transmission of polio here in New York. Um, yeah, not sure that's going to happen. But anyway, um, there was an article. <clears throat> I've been around you too much, Vincent. <laughs> not, enough, <laughs> not enough optimism. Um, but, there, you know, there was an article uh, recently um, in CNBC by Spencer Kimball. Um, and uh, I'll put a link in um, in the show notes um, or someone else will put it in for me, actually. Um, but I, I think it was I was really impressed. Um, and some of the things I was impressed by was that he really seemed to get um, vaccines and what they do. Um, He points out, as we have discussed, that although the inactivated vaccine that most of us have gotten is highly effective at preventing paralysis, it does not stop transmission of the virus. It doesn't keep you from getting infected. It doesn't keep you from spreading infection. But the oral polio vaccine is effective at stopping transmission of the virus, but this is temporary. So Uh, Just a nice, nice article, hopefully keeping people um, on target with what vaccines can and can't do. So, Daniel, the the problem I have with this is that we don't look for poliovirus in sewage elsewhere. So it's very possible that it's throughout the U.S. And to just focus this on New York is misguided, for one. Secondly, you know, this new OPV, NOPV2, has only been used for a short time, and you know, we're hoping it doesn't revert, but we actually don't know, and I think it may not be a good idea to fill our wastewater with NOPV2 because we're not <laughs> sure what's going to happen to it. Uh, you mean it might actually revert? We, we, we scientists might be wrong about it being uh, revertant resistant. Uh, it might revert no, just it, like, oh my gosh. I would never <laughs> bet on a virus not to mutate. I, I think that's that's what viruses do, right? Um, you know, any anyone who believes otherwise, you know, what is it? Jurassic Park, life finds a way. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, this is uh, a lot of truth in that statement. All right, the MMWR progress toward poliomyelitis eradication. 
Pakistan, January 2021 through July 2022. So a bit in the news about polio lately. Uh, just background here, after reporting a single wild polio virus, WPV type 1 case in 2021, uh, Pakistan reported 14 cases during the April 1 through July 31, 2022. Um, As per this report, Pakistan and Afghanistan are the only countries where endemic wild polio virus transmission transmission has never been interrupted. Um, All but one of these 14 um, wild polio virus type 1 cases in Pakistan um, have been reported from North Waziristan district in Khyber, Pakhunta. Uh, They also report that an outbreak... um, uh, began in Pakistan in 2019 and has been successfully ca- contained. So just giving people an update on what's going on out there. Um, but the the next article is the one that I thought was uh, really the most interesting. And <clears throat> I am hoping um, that we can regain some confidence in vaccines, which really were where damage was eroded during the last couple of years. And so this was an article, and, and I don't want people, you don't have to read it. Um, I'm going to sort of tell you. What the what's in there, but the article "Polio by the Numbers: A Global Perspective" uh, was recently published in JID. So it's a really interesting article looking at our world with polio vaccines versus a world where the polio vaccines had never been created. Um, and I don't know, um, you know, how many of our our listeners or watchers saw the TV series Counterpart. Um, but that was a two-season TV series uh, that aired, and I think this is important when it aired, December 10th, 2017 through February 17th, 2019. Um, and in this, this drama, there are these two initially identical worlds um, that are created due to an experiment in East Germany. And then the worlds greatly diverge after a severe flu, flu pandemic. Um, so I remember watching this show and thinking, oh, that's really interesting. They got all this footage of people walking around East Berlin um, with, with masks on. Um, so initially, as the one, the one world supposedly remains much like our world, but then the other has this pandemic and you see these scenes of people wearing masks. Well, um, in 2022, looking back on this series counterpart, I'm not sure which of those two worlds is more like our world. Um, but now back to the paper. So in this publication, the researchers um, use this, this counterpart, the, the two worlds, um, and they estimate um, that because of polio vaccines, um, 5 million cases of paralytic polio um, were prevented 1960 to 1987. Another 24 million cases of paralytic polio um, prevented 1988 through 2021. So in this sort of counterfactual world with no vaccines, um, in our world, um, about 30 million cases of paralytic polio have been um, prevented. Um, And they even talk a little about the impact of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. So, you know, when people have hesitancy, just just a a reminder of just how incredibly powerful um, vaccines can be. All right. Influenza, uh, the MMWR influenza and COVID-19 vaccination coverage among healthcare personnel, United States 2021 through 2022. Um, Now, a lot of places, this is strongly encouraged um, that healthcare personnel get influenza vaccination. But as we see here, um, healthcare personnel um, influenza vaccination coverage was 79.9% 79.9% during the 2021 through 2022 season. Um, they, they mentioned that 87.3% completed primary COVID vaccination, um, 67% of who received a booster dose. Um, influenza, primary COVID-19, and uh, COVID-19 booster coverage was higher among healthcare workers who reported employer vaccination requirements for these vaccines and was this is painful, lowest among healthcare workers in the long-term care setting environment. So in that environment where we have our highest risk, most vulnerable uh, people. So um, RSV, not to be left behind, uh, we are seeing a rapid increase in cases of RSV. Um, you, you know something's going on when your mother calls you up and asks about, what is this new virus? Well, it's not a new virus, mom. Um, this is already overwhelming some uh, hospitals. Um, 
as I mentioned, a tripling of cases just over the last two months based on CDC surveillance data. We're already um, at basically last year's peak, and here we are still um, in October. Um, this is part of that triple-demic that people um, people are talking about. Um, some exciting data, though, on RSV vaccines was presented at ID Week, and I will just mention one of the studies. Uh, there's a lot of background here on RSV and why it's taking so long, but the article, Phase 1, 2A, Safety and Immunogenicity of an Adenovirus 26 Vector RSV Vaccine Encoding Prefusion F in Adults 18 through 50 Years and RSV Seropositive Children 12 to 24 months was published in JID. So this is basically the results of a small, randomized, double-blind phase 1-2A placebo-controlled study with 12 adults and 36 RSV seropositive children, um, randomized to different doses of the vaccine or placebo at day 1 and day 29 with six-month immunogenicity and one-year safety follow-up. Um, and interesting, RSV infection was an exploratory outcome in children. That's, of course, what we're all going to care about. Um, no vaccine-related serious adverse events were reported. Um, that's encouraging. Small sample. Um, they, they give us baseline um, uh, geometric mean titers um, and showing increases. Not sure if we know exactly what that translates into. Um, but here, RSV infection was confirmed in fewer children that received uh, the vaccine, so that was 4.2%, than placebo, which was 41.7%, uh, so almost a tenfold reduction. You got a hand up there, Vincent. Yeah, given the delay, it's easier to raise my hand to ask a question. <laughs> so did they actually look for blocking infection, so they did PCR on these kids? So it was... so. It, at least my understanding was that this was um, infection confirmed. So wow. it was our, it was not just screening people with with PCRs. It was symptomatic confirmed to be RSV. And in most cases, we are, well, we're doing uh, PCRs to confirm RSV in most cases. Okay. I should say in most cases, because a lot of our urgent care centers have these, these quad antigen rapid um, tests, which are really nice. Someone comes in, they've got some upper respiratory symptoms, um, and we'll go ahead and we'll look for influenza A and B. We'll look for COVID and we'll look for RSV with these rapid tests. Um, you know, because, well, if you have more than one, it makes sense. Um, as far as treatment, it's going to guide treatment, but also it's going to help with prognosis. We'll, we'll talk about some data in the future. You know, if you have more than one thing, not surprising, um, your likelihood of progressing to hospitalization, your likelihood of a worse outcome um, increases. All right. Ebola. Um, next week, people are, why, Dr. Griffin, haven't you been talking about Ebola? I understand you're heading to Uganda in a few weeks. So what's up with Ebola? Well, I have been keeping my eye on it. Um, and next week, we will be recording at the annual meeting of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, and I will, I will add some information um, about the current situation with Ebola in Uganda at that meeting. And now to the monkeypox, um, still trending down in terms of new cases being diagnosed per day, um, but we are now up to six deaths, maybe more from the monkeypox. Uh, just, just announced that two people here in New York um, had died, two people in Chicago, a man in Nevada died over the last week with monkeypox virus. Always the question about um, how much did that play a role in the death? Um, one of the concerns, and maybe the WHO is right on this, is that we are seeing more severe infections. So this has me concerned that we're missing a lot of the mild cases. I don't, I don't think that suddenly the monkeypox has become more virulent. So when a higher percent of the cases are more severe, you worry that that's just that we're missing all the uh, less virulent cases. Um, we did hear about... Uh, the uh, Genios vaccine, um, sort of an impressive number here in the MMWR receipt of first and second doses of Genios vaccine for prevention of monkeypox in the United States, May 22nd through October 10, 2022, early release. We heard that by October 10th, a total of 931,155 Genios vaccine doses had been administered in the United States, so almost a million doses. So uh, really, really impressive. Um, but remember that, um, you know, we're still learning here. So if you get diagnosed with monkeypox, if you maybe 
make the diagnosis of monkeypox, um, let's get folks involved in the stomptpox.org trial to see if our antiviral works. All right. And uh, COVID, um, right up front in the COVID section, I want to start with, with an article that actually addresses a concerning challenge for us. This is the article, Distinguishing SARS-CoV-2 Persistence and Reinfection, a Retrospective Cohort Study Published in CID. So here, here's the scenario. A person had COVID recently and their PCR is positive admission. Well, what to do? So here, all individuals at a large academic medical center who underwent a SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid amplification test, I like they call it that, not a COVID test, um, greater than or equal to 45 days after an initial positive test. Um, both tests had to be between March 14th and December 30th, 2020, um, were analyzed for potential reinfection. So inclusion criteria required having um, at least two positive uh, NATs collected um, at least 45 days apart with a CT value of less than 35 on all the repeat tests. Um, for each included subject, the likelihood of reinfection was assessed by viral genomic analysis of all available specimens that had that CT value less than 35, a structured CT trajectory criteria, and a case-by-case -case review by infectious disease physicians. Um, so we start with these two infectious disease specialists up at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, um, and they are tasked with categorizing the patients as either being low or moderate to high clinical suspicion for reinfection based on chart review, right? So they're asking the ID, what do you think? And the ID doc says, ah, I think this is just rem remnant, viral shedding, as people tend to say. No need to worry here. Um, then they get CT values, um, but the ID clinicians don't have access to that yet. And then they go ahead and they get genomic data to really ask, is this that prior infection or is this a new infection that is uh, distinct? Um, they found, and this is a bit frightening, that clinical and CT value-based assessments fail to identify one-third of genomically supported reinfection. So a third of the time, um, we're getting it wrong in our as, as ID docs. Um, a third of the time, that CT um, value is not giving us the information. Um, a lot for discussion here. A couple things that were disturbing here, I will say. Um, immune suppressed people with CT values that stayed in the 20s for past two months, as they described here, are they still infectious? Um, how does this impact our utilization of private rooms? I, I don't know if I shared uh, my discussion with the Germans who thought we were all crazy, uh, putting all these people in with COVID in the same rooms and not doing any sequencing. Um, you know, perhaps SARS-CoV-2 can recombine and we're just creating these little mixing pots in our, in our hospital. So um, a little challenge here um, and, and maybe uh, necessary to redefine um, how we approach reinfections and infection control issues. Vincent, I don't know if you had any thoughts. All right. So what we're saying here is that a fraction of the time, these are reinfections, right? Because the genome tells you it's a different variant, a different virus, yep. let's say, correct? Yep. Okay. Yes. So so you're, you're worried that that's one thing, it's to clarify so that people understand that. It's not persistence. So in, in yeah. some cases, yeah, it's persistence. Yeah. yeah. And the other issue is you're worried about putting people in the same room because you're worried that these different viruses are going to recombine. Well, I would say this has been happening for two years now, two years plus out there in the wild. These viruses have had the opportunity to recombine. It's happened. Nothing untoward has come of it. So I, I'm not sure that's an issue that should drive how you're housing these patients. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's important. I mean, the first part is pretty straightforward. Someone comes in, we say, does this person need isolation? Um, third of the time, maybe we're getting it wrong. We say, no, nah, they were positive like, you know, 50 days ago. This is probably just from that infection. Well, maybe we're missing a new infection and we're putting someone. Um, but yeah, we, we have billions of people participating in the, uh, in the evolution of uh, SARS-CoV-2 out there in the world.
All right, children, COVID, and vulnerable populations. Um, this was, I thought, a little sobering. According to the Government Accountability Organization, um, they are attributing 25% um, of maternal deaths in 2020 and 2021 um, to COVID-19. I should, as they say, COVID-19 contributed to 25% of maternal deaths in 2020 and 2021. So uh, just continuing to point out, um, you know, which population are high risk. Um, all right, so some updates on vaccines and uh, children here. The CDC's independent vaccine advisors voted 15 to 0, that's unanimous, Thursday, 10 20, 2022, to add most COVID 19 vaccines offered in the U.S. to the childhood, adolescent, and adult immunization schedules. Um, just some background here because I know this has been. Uh, taken out of context, I'm going to say. Um, the immunization schedules are updated every fall before going into effect the following year. Um, the COVID vaccine's inclusion on the schedules does not constitute a mandate, particularly for school children. Um, this is the purview of states, localities, jurisdictions, depending on local laws. Um, the committee also unanimously voted to add COVID-19 vaccines to the federal Vaccines for Children program. Um, this is important. This move allows the shots to be provided for free to children of families who might not otherwise be able to afford them, um, such as those who are eligible for Medicaid, um, underinsured or uninsured, uh, Alaskan, um, Native, American, Indian. Um, also, adding COVID vaccines to the routine childhood immunization schedule is the first step in potentially getting the shots covered by the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, um, which is a more established program um, that allows for those who um, may have had vaccine injuries to pursue uh, settlements um, from the federal government rather than the vaccine manufacturers. Um, I will comment, right, we're hearing that the prices and these COVID vaccines may be um, over $100 per shot. So uh, the idea that uh, uh, we're going to have access, um, free access for the underserved, I think is very important from an equity point of view. Um, human Health and Services um, would also have to formally add vaccines to the VICP, and Congress would have to pass legislation. So there's a lot that needs to go on here. But um, a lot of this is really a move toward an acceptance that COVID is here to stay. Um, just one more vaccine in the list of vaccines we use for preventable illnesses. Um, you know, I will point out one thing, which is, I think is interesting. You know, there's already over 20 states that actually have state laws on the books um, that um, prevent mandation, uh, wide, wide mandates for COVID vaccines. So sort of an interesting um, move at the state level. All right. Um, uh, the pre-exposure period, I'm going to do a little bit of a reminder on masks next time because people seem to have forgot their effectiveness. Um, but remember, this is the time when I tell people you should have a plan. Um, and part of that plan is uh, getting your COVID vaccination. Um, we did get a little bit movement here. Novavax got approval, um, EUA, um, as a booster on October 19th, 2022. So this is uh, sort of a, this is a change, um, but let me read the revised fact sheet. So what, what exactly does this mean? Um, Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, adjuvanted, is authorized for emergency use to provide a first booster dose to individuals 18 years of age and older for whom an FDA-authorized mRNA bivalent COVID-19 booster vaccine is not accessible or clinically appropriate, and to individuals 18 years of age and older who elect to receive the Novavax um, vaccine adjuvanted because they would otherwise not receive a booster dose. So little, little subtleties here, right? This is a first booster dose. This is not a, you know, second, third booster dose. Um, it's the same dose. It's 0 0.5 milliliters of the uh, Novavax vaccine um, at least six months after completion of a primary vaccination series. Now, Dr. Griffin, but does this stuff work? Well, there is some data here. I, I was able to find a preprint. 
uh, Marcia should say it was shared with me, so thank you. Uh, the preprint Novavax NVX CoV 2373 triggers potent neutralization of Omicron sublineages. Uh, so here they report that after a third dose of Novavax, um, there were high titers of antibodies against Omicron BA1 and BA4 slash 5, uh, with responses similar in magnitude to those triggered by three doses of an mRNA vaccine. Um, not sure we know exactly what, what that means, but that that's the data that we've been working with. All right. We also heard last week, Moderna says Omicron booster response stays high through three months. Um, interesting on a few levels. Um, one is that the booster was approved August 31st, and here we are with three months of data. So I just want to point out um, that a lot of people are like, they released these boosters and they never gave them to people. Well, obviously, if we have three months of data, this means human beings had gotten this vaccine prior to approval. Um, I do know that the mouse data was what was presented, but we did actually have human beings. We had safety. We, we had... Uh, yeah, so that was a myth that boosters were released prior to being given to human beings, but it's a, a myth with long legs. All right, this, this people will like or not like. Um, it depends if you enjoy exercise, but the article association between regular physical activity and the protective effect of vaccination against SARS-CoV-2 in a South African case control study published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. So this is another one of these test negative case control studies um, that they use to estimate the risk of having an associated COVID-19 related hospital admission among individuals who were unvaccinated compares with those who were fully vaccinated with the J&J &J vaccine. 196,444 participant tests were stratified into these three measured physical activity subgroups, low, moderate, and high activity, to test the hypothesis that physical effect is an effect modifier on the relationship between vaccination and hospitalization. Um, Vincent, I have to say, I'm wondering if you just forgot about vaccination and just looked at low, moderate, and high activity and exercise. But anyway, they reported that vaccine effectiveness against a COVID-19 related admission among vaccinated individuals within the low activity group was 60%, 72% for moderate, 85.8% for the high activity group. Um, so compared with individuals with a low activity level, vaccinated individuals with moderate and high activity levels had a 1.4 and 2.8 times lower risk of COVID-19 admission, respectively. That's very impressive, don't you think? I'm trying to figure out, is it the exercise or is it really the exercise and the, Plus um, the, the vaccine? vaccine? Yeah. Right. So yeah, it, I mean, it, it, yeah. in line with that, Daniel, someone asked last night, does it matter what time of day that you get the vaccine? Is it better in the morning or does it not matter? Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, it's really critical that you get it in the evening. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, I can't say that we've studied that, but it's, you know, it's it's an interesting thing to think about, right? We get our, our, our AM cortisol surge. Would it be better to get it in the evening because maybe there's going to be more, you know, reactogenicity, yeah. more immune response? I don't think we, I don't think we know. And there's actually, it's interesting. We've been using vaccines for so many decades. These seem like interesting studies. Let's, let's yeah, get antibodies yeah. and T cell. Let's vaccinate one group in the morning and one group in the evening. Um, you know, and then you worry like, okay, now that's got to be a problem because what we all have to work in the evenings because the best time to get a vaccine is 9 PM. Sure, right. So sure. maybe we don't want to know Vincent. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't let science stand in the way of your lifestyle. All right. Um, COVID passive vaccination, EVU shelled. So tixagevimab co-packaged with silgavimab, um, still recommended for adults and pediatric individuals 12 years of age and older um, who have moderate to severe immune compromise um, or may not mount an adequate immune response or can't get the vaccine. Um, we did get um, the article, COVID-19 outcomes in solid organ transplant recipients who received tixagevimab, silgavimab, ebuchel prophylaxis, and or bebtilovimab treatment, so MAB treatment, in a nurse-driven monoclonal antibody program during the Omicron surge. This was published in the journal Transplantation. Um, so we have an interesting table uh, looking at those that developed COVID-19, those that were hospitalized, those that died. Um, seeing here um, in the um, in the 
EVU shelled 150-150 group, uh, about 28.5% developed um, COVID-19. Um, we can compare that to the um, the 150, and then later they get 150-150. I don't know if people remember when we bumped the dose in the middle. Um, with an N of 35, nobody in that group developed COVID. Nobody got hospitalized. Nobody died. If we looked at just the higher dose, the 300-300, just given up front as one, um, we saw 7.6% um, developed COVID-19. Only 1.2% um, were hospitalized. Uh, less than 1% died. So, um, just sort of uh, you know more more data, um, but really you know it's hard. No no placebo group here, so um, just hard to sort out what the what the exact impact is here. Um, but and this is uh, this is the depressing part of of today's uh, talk. Um, the article Omicron sublineage BA.2.75.2 exhibits extensive escape from neutralizing antibodies uh, posted as a preprint. Um, you know, in this context, I'm fine with bringing this up as a preprint, as this is really a neutralizing antibody information. Um, and there, there's a table uh, looking at the, the neutralization of uh, the different um, monoclonals out there with the different variants. Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, not looking great for the uh, tixagevimab, silgavimab. They actually put them together and uh, BA.4.6 not doing well, BA.2.10.4 not doing well, BA.2.75.2 not doing well. Um, I assume this is um, pseudovirus neutralization um, assays. I couldn't really sort that out from the preprint. I shot an email to one of the authors, so uh, hopefully get some clarification. But concerns going forward to uh, patients who are relying on this for protection um, as we see more of these variants. All right. Moving into the early viral upper respiratory um, phase, this is really a reminder. Um, number one, the number one recommended um, treatment is Paxlovid with that 89 to 88% reduction in the unvaccinated, probably about a 75% reduction in the vaccinated. Um, we keep hearing about this this rebound, and it really I have to say this is this is impacting negatively people getting this tremendous benefit. Uh, recently, had a 68 year old, um, you know, had some medical issues, was carrying some extra weight, um, and we had a really long discussion because they were not sure with all the negative things they had heard about Paxlovid. Um, and I sort of laid it out for them. I said, okay, you know, here's where you stand. Before we had any therapies and vaccines, about 20% of folks were ending up in the hospital. Your risk probably was a little bit higher at baseline, let's say 30%. You got your vaccines. Let's say we drop you down to three. That's one in 30. We can drop you down to one in 300 if we add Paxlovid to this. So um, sometimes you really got to walk through with people. Um, the goal is not to turn this into a five or six day illness. The goal is to keep people out of the hospital. The goal is to keep people from dying. The goal is to keep people from progressing where they end up on a ventilator uh, with permanent damage to their lungs. Um, so just uh, really, really tough. Let's, uh, let's focus on the science. Uh, number two, remdesivir, um, about an 87% reduction um, based on that New England Journal of Medicine article, if given in the first seven days. Um, really difficult to get access here, but a great option when we have access. And number three, um, head to head, a little bit inferior to the first two choices. That's our Beb to Lovimab, our monoclonal. So the science we have suggests this should not be your first, but your third choice. And number four, molnupiravir down with about a 30% reduction. Um, avoiding the steroids, avoiding the antibiotics, um, and hopefully patients are then doing well, and most of them are not progressing to severe second week, early inflammatory, um, but that's where we have less effective tools. Steroids in the right patient at the right dose. Remember, this is only about a 17% mortality reduction, not an 89% reduction in progression, but only a 17% mortality reduction. Um, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, um, maybe remdesivir if we're still in the first 10 days, but diminishing um, returns, immune modulation. Um, and um, I will say there were some interesting presentations at ID Week um, revisiting immune modulation. Um, so we got some results from the Active One IM trial looking at infliximab and abatacept versus placebo for COVID-19 pneumonia. So infliximab is a TNF neutralizing monoclonal and 
Abatacept is a soluble cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated protein for analog that prevents antigen presenting cells from delivering that co-stimulatory signal and activating those T cells. So more immune modulation for week two, the rebound period, as I like to call it, the early inflammatory phase. Um, the primary endpoint for time to recovery was not statistically significant. Um, interesting, the secondary outcome was mortality at day 28. This occurred in 10% of the infliximab patients compared to 14.5 of placebo, so odds ratio 0.59, in 11% of the um, abatacept patients versus 15.1% of placebo patients there. So patients on low flow oxygen and those with higher levels of CRP appeared to benefit more. Um, you know, little data mining, I think, when you start sort of breaking it down there, but I'll just sort of say that. Um, but not data to suggest that restrictive stewardship criteria where we only give this to people on high levels of pulmonary support that are the least likely to benefit. So uh, think about that as, as we start um, considering these newer agents. Also, our old friend, or is it a new friend, Sabizabulin. Hmm. Um, <laughs> These are the results of a subgroup analysis of a phase three trial of 88 patients with a documented comorbidity who also needed oxygen by mask or nasal prongs. Uh, deaths were significantly lo lower among those receiving oral sabizabulin compared with those on placebo, 5.2% versus 27.6% with a p-value of 0 0.0090. So this was reported by uh, Dr. Paula Scarda of Regions Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, Patients that ended up getting sabizabulin also saw significant reductions in length of hospital stay, 13 versus 24 with placebo. Days spent in the ICU, 4 versus 17, or on a ventilator, 3 versus 17. So interim analysis, the full trial population, um, which included patients with a WHO score of 4 to 6, showed a 51.6 relative reduction in mortality at 60 days with this oral microtubule disruptor. Um, so an FDA advisory committee is slated to meet next month to discuss whether the data are sufficient to support the EUA of sabizabulin in patients with moderate to severe COVID-19 at high risk for, for ARDS. And this, this may be the right therapy for those sicker individuals. Um, we also had the article Tocilizumab versus baricitinib in hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19, an open-label randomized control trial published in CMI. Um, so as in the title, these are the results of an open-label randomized control trial um, addressing whether or not baricitinib was non-inferior to tocilizumab for immune modulation in COVID-19. Um, sort of impressive that TOSI's become the gold standard to which you don't want to be inferior. The primary outcome was mechanical ventilation or death by day 28. Secondary outcomes included time to hospital discharge by day 28, change in WHO progression. Um, the authors assigned 251 patients to uh, with COVID-19 receive TOSI, that was 126, baricitinib, 125, plus standard of care, they found that baricitinib was non-inferior to TOSI for the primary compositive outcome of mechanical ventilation or death by day 28. Um, baricitinib was non-inferior to TOSI for time to hospital discharge within 28 days and no significant difference in WHO scale at day 10 as far as severity. Um, so more, more on the immune modulation front. Um, I will close as I always do with... Um, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, this pandemic continues with hundreds of people dying per day here in the U.S., hundreds more, if not thousands more around the world. Um, so pause right here and thank you for everyone who does this. Go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and click on the donate button. Every small amount counts and we are really close. This is going to drop on Saturday with just a couple days left in our floating doctors fundraiser. So help us reach our goal. Help us provide that potential donation of $40,000 to floating doctors. It's time for questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Josh writes, for a high risk individual, 
recently infected with SARS-CoV-2, does it make sense to take multiple treatments? My grandmother is in her 80s, a kidney transplant recipient boosted recently on Evusheld, thanks to TWIV. She tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 in her hospital, having ruled out Paxlovid is giving her Bebtilovimab. Would it help for her to also take Remdesivir? It's hard to tell whether of the four recommended early treatments, Paxlovid, Remdesivir, Bebtilovimab, and Molnupiravir, each patient is supposed to take only one or take as many as seems safe. Yeah, no, this is this is great. And hopefully this is a learning lesson for us. So, um, you know, we do not know um, how people do when they get multiple therapies. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit in some of our ID podcasts about um, sometimes when we give multiple antibiotics for bacterial infections, actually people do worse than if they are on sort of the one best therapy. That's different with tuberculosis. It's different with HIV. So, you know, it would make sense. It seems to make sense giving someone a monoclonal, giving someone an antiviral that works by another by another route. Um, but we don't know. We need to do the studies. There's, there's anecdotes out there. There's people doing this out there. Um, but ultimately, like everything else, um, we need to have that humility to say, this is an interesting question. We need to ask it properly. We need to get the right science um, because COVID's here to stay. These decisions are going to continue to be in front of us. Um, once these are licensed, we don't want people doing willy-nilly. We want evidence-based guidance giving us the best outcomes for our patients. Lillian writes, I've heard you speak many times about not giving steroids in the early phase of COVID treatment. And I'm wondering if you could sp explain in layman's terms the science behind this, so to speak, and why it's not a good idea. An acquaintance of mine just tested positive for the second time and was definitely given steroids early the first time. I wanted to be able to pass along your knowledge with a more detailed explanation other than to just tell them it's not a good idea, as I know they will ask me why. <laughs> okay. Well, I think the, the real why is we've studied it, right? And so there are a couple articles, and we'll leave um, links in the show notes. So, so one study actually looked at people getting um, steroids during the first week, and overall progression to severe disease and hospitalization was increased sixfold um, if they gave those to folks during the first week with oxygen saturations greater than 94%. They actually had a mortality increase of 35%, right? Um, another study where they did um, t greater than 20 milligrams per day of prednisolone equivalent, um, that had an associate hospital admission odds ratio of, of 2.5, more than doubling, more than doubling cardiac events, almost tripling your risk of pulmonary embolism, and then again, a 3.5-fold increase of mortality. So um, the, the science, we studied it. It's associated with increased risk of progression, increased risk of death. Now, now, why why is it? What what's the mechanism? What do we think the mechanism is? Um, we think it's during the first week um, when your body is trying to um, respond, trying to respond to the virus. Um, and prevent ongoing viral replication, you're basically shutting it down. Um, people who've been vaccinated and get steroids, I say, why'd you even bother with the vaccine? Here was your chance for your, your primed, educated immune system to jump in, and you just turned it off with the steroids. Um, so that's sort of the, the mechanistic idea behind the science. Mary writes, please speak to when baseline LFTs, PT slash INR, and EGFRs are needed for three-day remdesivir prior to administration and whether retesting during the course is needed. Since the course is so short and it can take more than 24 hours for outpatient lab results to be available, it's likely that the timing for the second and third dose may roll around before test results are known. Was this retesting initially recommended for a longer course of remdesivir? The pine tree study suggests that outpatients with mild to moderate COVID-19 administered three-day remdesivir may not require baseline creatinine if they weigh over 48 kilograms. What about baseline LFTs and PTINR? What about retesting? Any insights you have would be appreciated. Yeah, so these these are great. These are great questions. So um, the EGFR for our listeners, that's really an estimate of kidney function, um, estimated glomerular filtration rate. Um, you know, initially when remdesivir first came out, um, there was a lot of hesitancy to use it in people that had compromised renal function. At this point in time, um, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of experience um, using remdesivir independent of kidney function. So I am, I'm not concerned about kidney function. Also good evidence that remdesivir does not cause 
renal failure. So just I'll put that out there. You can send me hate mail. But um, no, ser- search it. Look at the literature. Um, at this point, we feel like remdesivir is a very kidney-safe medicine. Um, what about liver function tests? What about elevated liver function tests? Um, there is a rare situation where the liver function tests, um, those AST, LAT, the transaminases are five-fold or more above normal, um, where it's recommended that we not do remdesivir. But again, that was based on these early trials, uh, five, 10-day courses. Um, with a three-day course, um, I think you can look at the risk benefit there. Um, a lot of the settings where you're going to be able to give um, IV remdesivir, you could probably get a comprehensive metabolic panel back pretty quickly. Um, But again, it's a risk benefit. If you've got someone that you're worried about that's high risk, here's your opportunity to reduce the risk of progression by close to 90%. Um, I think it's reasonable to go ahead and then try to get the data when you can. And finally, Kathleen writes, thank you for discussing the recently reported occupational exposure of the nurse to monkeypox virus resulting in an infection. As reported in MMWR, the needle stick occurred when recapping the used needle by hand before disposal. I think this might be a very good teachable moment. I can't help myself as a clinician and safety professional to remind, never recap a needle. If one must absolutely cover the needle prior to disposing in a sharps container, then utilize the one-handed technique. Just my two cents when discussing the needle stick that resulted in the genarian pustule pustule four days later. Thoughts? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, kudos. I was listening to the the MMWR, um, you know, podcast weekly briefing, um, and just as they described the uh, the exposure when the person was recapping the needle. Come on, yeah. Let, let's be more careful. That's TWIV weekly clinical update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you so much, and everyone, be safe. 